Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the webinar, Zambia Beyond the Pain. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the API Summit Virtual and is part of our preview webinar series leading up to the virtual event taking place between the 28th of September and the 2nd of October. This year's API Summit gathering is taking place online and will provide you with five days of networking, content and leading insights. Um, as well as access to the Africa PropTech Forum and the API award, Awards. Um, we are expecting over 800 attendees on the live platform and have already confirmed over 100 speakers for the event. For more information and to register, please, join, oh, please visit API Summit website. I would now like to introduce today's panel, uh, which will be moderated by Tim Ware, the Managing Director of Nightfrank Zambia. Tim will also set the scene with a Zambia market update presentation. Today's panel uh, will include Inutu Zalumis, co-founder and managing director of PAMS Golding Zambia, Soheil Dudai, president of Zambia Properties Owners Association, Mumba Musunga, portfolio manager, African Life Financial Services. Thank you all for joining us, uh, the audience and the panel. Um, I'll now hand over to Tim, who will begin with the presentation and then moderate today's discussion. Thanks. Um, Tim, if you can switch on your video and audio. Sorry, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome, thanks to Kafir for the introductions. I'd like to start off with a presentation on the Zambian property market and first of all look at the background to the market by looking at the country in terms of the macroeconomics of the country right now and the last six months. Zambia's population is around 18 million. It's forecast to grow to 24 plus million by 2030. And one of the key things is the urban population, which is around 44% now around the country and forecast to grow to over 50% by 2030. If you look at the chart on the left there, there's a blue line, which I hope you can see, which is the inflation and the red bars are GDP. Red bars for GDP going back to 2000 show the steady growth in GDP annually over the sort of first 10 years, well above five, six percent. And then the second half of the chart, you see how the growth has slowed down. And the last three or four charts there, you can see GDP last year was about one and a half percent. This year, it's forecast to be contracting, obviously impacted by the pandemic by three and a half percent, but it's forecast to rebound next year in the order of two or 2.3 percent. Inflation, also if you can track that blue line going back to 2000, you can see how steadily it's been brought under control. And then in the middle of the chart, it starts to go up again, then dramatically falls down. And in the last six to 12 months, it's seen a rise and it's sitting at 15.5%. So all of these are key background factors to decisions in property, to those trading in property, uh, and, and to those renting and buying property. The exchange rate is currently at around 19.4 quatcha to the US dollar. And some aspects and important aspects of our market here are linked to the dollar exchange rate in terms of dollar rentals in particular. So the exchange rate, which has lost um, the devaluation of the quatcha that has lost about 30% in the last six months has also had an impact and something that we'll talk about today. In terms of bank interest rates, the central bank over the last few months has been reducing its benchmark rate 
to now 8% just a few days ago. And obviously that will help to stimulate the economy as those rates have been taken up by the bank to also reduce their bank lending rates. They're still high, but the bank is pushing down rates as much as it can. The office market in Lusaka particularly is dominated by a number of good buildings and an increasing in supply in the last particularly two years. And in the face of the pandemic, it's been fairly resilient. It was starting to go through an adjustment last year. The pandemic has hastened that adjustment. And there are a number of negotiations going on between landlords and tenants. Those that are in existing buildings. And then we have tenants who are looking to take space. And we have landlords that are sitting with a number of buildings where they need to find tenants. But the market is oversupplied at the moment. So these renegotiations are very much a factor of the market. If you look at the chart on the right, those represent dollar rental figures per square meter. Going back to 2013, where the rent was around $22 per square meter per month. The top red bar is at about $25 a square meter. Then the next five, you're coming to 2020, and you can see how dollar rentals have slowly declined. And we're sitting at around $18 per square meter as at now for the best buildings in Lusaka. Sometimes it can be a little bit higher historically, and there are negotiations going on below that level as well, at least where for a short term of period, a rental can be agreed, at least can be agreed for 12 months, for 24 months to carry us through an adjustment going forward. It's worth mentioning that there is still a strong demand for resi properties, residential houses in key areas of the city. And these are still occupied and leased by companies. They find them suitable, they find them easy to rent, to look after, and there's still a reasonable demand. And sometimes those rentals are paid in Quacha. And these are often in very good locations. The, the, the dominant theme in the residential market in Zambia continues to be self-build projects. So an individual will buy a piece of land and build his or her own house over a period of time. And this may take anything from two years to five or six years or longer subject to financing. We do not have mass housing development yet. Building costs have been one of the reasons. They've also reduced in the last couple of years. Also, the main reason has been the high interest rates, the high lending rates from the banks. However, the, the, the residential market is still growing. We see if you come into Lusaka, when we can fly, hopefully soon again, you'll see that there are a number of plots being developed everywhere at different stages of development. And the new roads that are being developed around not only Lusaka, but some of the other cities as well, in the Copper Belt, in Dola, in Kitwe, and even to the south in the southern province and the west, you, you're seeing roads being completed and infrastructure being undertaken to support in the future growth of these neighborhoods. However, overall at the moment, the market is expected to remain tenant driven. In terms of retail, the pandemic has had an adverse effect on this sector. It's resulted in tenants vacating space or having to negotiate short term rentals. In Zambia, we had a lockdown three or so months ago for a period of about a month. But the shopping centers still remained open, but limited to just essential, such as the supermarket and some of the banks and pharmacies. Over the last two or three months, they have opened up, they're trading, visitors are going to the stores, they're going to the malls, but obviously following the protocols that we have in place now in terms of sanitizing, wearing masks, social distancing. Recently in the market, we've seen the closure of the spa corporate owned stores. But a number of these, the smaller stores in the order of a thousand square meters have actually been taken out 
by Pick and Pay, who've reopened and branded as Pick and Pay a previous spa store. And this is a model that we've seen Pick and Pay do in particularly Lusaka and may well do elsewhere around the country. But retailers, generally it's a difficult time for landlords as well. Due to the pandemic, the cost of devaluation, the dollar rental issue, and higher inflation, uh, which has led to pressure on rentals and also pressure on costs. So briefly, just to finish off, what about alternative real estate sectors? Agriculture is an investment opportunity. It may not be the first sector that you think about compared to offices and retail and warehousing, but it does have some resilience, particularly recently in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, where small-scale farmers, for example, have been able to supply supermarkets where sometimes there have been shortages due to logistics coming in and being imported. We, we see the future in the urbanization around the country. We see a steady population growth of around 2.8, maybe a little bit higher, 3% per annum. All of these, together with the better road infrastructure and improvements in irrigation, are an investment opportunity when you start to look at the diversification in the sector. So it isn't just growing maize now, it's looking at nuts, it's looking at berries, uh, fruits, citrus fruits, for example. The other sectors to think about are medical and education. We know that education with schools and universities being forced to close have had a, a, a less of a development period in the last six months, but it does remain a very key and good opportunity for property investment in the long term. And then finally, medical. I think in a lot of countries, Zambia is not alone in the weaknesses that have come through in the healthcare sector. And this is resulting in a need for investment in the clinics and hospitals all around the country and at different levels. We have seen this starting already a little bit with some new clinics in Lusaka and elsewhere around the country and some new hospitals as well. But I think it is something that investors and institutional investors would want to look at in the future. Research is key. And just to end on that slide, we all need regular research to support our decisions in going forward in the, di in the different investment opportunities. So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to make that presentation. It was a brief overview and I hope gives you some understanding of the market where we are now and allows us to then lead on to now some discussion that I'm going to moderate and lead with, with the panel. And thank you for the panel for joining us today. So I'd like to start, if the panel can join me, Hopefully they'll be able to join. Uh, there we go. Great. Welcome, Inutu, Mumba, and Sehel. Good to see you all. Good to see you too. Thank you. So I'd like to start, um, Inutu. Um, if I can ask you about the the sectors really. We know that it's a tough trading climate at the moment, um, but are you seeing any sectors or have you seen any sectors that are more resilient than, than any others? And also, what strategies would you see in the market where owners and developers can use to, to, to fight some, some of these issues and to weather the storm? Thanks a lot, Tim. Um... Yes, we have seen two sectors that have been fairly resilient throughout this, the, throughout this pandemic and also through our economic, uh, current economic situation as a country. The two sectors are the uh, residential mid-market rental markets, that is below um, 10,000 kwacha and below, 
we've seen resilience there. Um, the other one um, is the um, serviced land sales as well, serviced land parcels that are in uh, what we call the newly established emerging uh, residential areas. And as you alluded to in your presentation, um, that has really been driven by the increase in infrastructure that has happened in those areas, the growth of the cities. Um, with regards to the, the mid-market rental, um, what we found there is that, as you know, um, we are a very large renting market in Zambia. Mortgages being north of 20% uh, create a barrier in itself in terms of um, home ownership. But at the same time, whilst uh, we are very big on renting, we're also very big on market. So where we've seen um, a resilience um, is in the purchase of plots, roughly between 600 square meters to 1,500 square meters, uh, and the price ranging between 150,000 to 300,000 kwacha. We've seen significant activity at that end of the market. Yeah, thanks, Anuta. I think it's an interesting point you make about mid to lower rentals. That's always a really, really busy sector around the country uh, and there's strong demand there. And even for, for housing as well at the lower end, uh, which is something we, we may come on to. And I saw, I think it was today that the national housing policy has just been launched. I think it came out today. So that'll be interesting to, to read through that as well. Um, but the service land sales, we know that our market is still dominated by that self-build. Yes. Self-build yes, projects. Very yeah. nice. So I, I think it's that's great. that's continuing and it hasn't changed and, and I think it'll be strong going forward. Yes. Thank you, Renuti. Um, so Hale, um, before this year, the market was already going through a, a period of adjustment, I think. We had some oversupply in the market. What What would you allude to what would you say have been the lessons um, that we've learned from from that recent market cycle sorry Sahel are you are you on mute by any chance can see you, but we couldn't hear you. Maybe I'll just, can you hear us? Okay. Can't hear you, I'm afraid, Sahel, but maybe while we're trying to fix that, um, if I could ask Mumba uh, a, a question. Um, Mumba Retail, um, do you think that shopping is still a lifestyle? habit in, in Zambia? And what what do you think about online shopping, um, particularly where we've seen less requirement, um, less need to go to the shopping centers for the health reasons with the COVID? What do you think about that going forward? Um, hello, Tim. Hello, fellow panelists. Um, firstly, am, am I clear? Am I audible? Very clear. Thank you. Oh, great, great. Um, good question that you raise. I mean, shopping lifestyle, um, shopping centers, is, a, a, is that a still, is that a lifestyle? I know, I think since, is it the 2017 when, when, when Amazon acquired Whole Foods, um, there's been this push towards, okay, is the shopping center, the traditional shopping center dead? Um, would that then mean that um, everything is going digital? I think the biggest disruptor, like you have said, has been this COVID scenario. But even before COVID, I think the internet has been the biggest uh, disruptor and companies such as Amazon are leading that charge, um, reducing foot traffic quite substantially in, in other developed markets. I think when you bring it to, 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 to more, much more closer to home um, in, and in certain emerging markets, I think there's still more scope for your traditional shopping center. Of course, um, with COVID and, and, and other uh, changes, uh, we, we can anticipate maybe the model of your traditional mall is going to change going into the future. Uh, if you look at uh, the drive towards fintech, um, what does that then mean for your traditional banks? Um, we might see much smaller banks, much more uh, service-oriented banks. Uh, we, we do see, um, especially 
um, in, in, in some commercial banks, the, 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 the number of tellers ha has reduced quite substantially from the, from the time that has been. And so you, we, we do think um, into going into the future, maybe your traditional shopping center uh, will be affected by some of those, those, those fundamental changes. We think maybe our shop sizes, especially, um, might, might see a bit of a reduction. If, if more retailers go online, um, there might be more of a push towards um, distribution centers or maybe even shopping centers being used as, as, as distribution centers rather than uh, places where, 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 where customers come in and pick up their goods and, and services. Uh, and, and so I think fundamentally there is a bit of a shift. I think in, in your emerging markets, uh, the shift is much slower. Um, uh, for example, you'll find um, in, in, in much more developed markets where, where the internet penetration is much deeper and you do find the GDP per capita for some of those economies are much higher. Uh, adoption of, 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 of maybe online shopping is a lot more pr prevalent. Uh, but I think uh, in the Zambian context, um, the traditional shopping center, I believe, is here to stay. Um, I think maybe the, the, the era of the big, uh, big more 30, 40,000 square meters more might come down a bit because of where we are economically. Uh, but you, we still think there is scope uh, when we start seeing economic, uh, the economics starting to recover. Because at the end of the day, I think consumers still want a one-stop shop where they can do a lot of what they can, a lot of the, the, the basic shopping and services in a, in a one more convenient area. Um, and I think that is still here to stay uh, for some time. Yeah, thanks, Mumba. I mean, you made some really good points there. I think something that we have seen is the reduction in sizes of shops. So retailers, um, I remember when banks would contact a new tool myself looking for space and they wanted 300 square meters. Uh, now it's 50 square meters or you know, 150, 100, you know, 50 to 100 square meters. And, and now, as you say, it's, it's moving more to the electronic and obviously we're using our, our phones for certain things as well. And I think another thing to think about for the future is maybe some of these malls changing a little bit in what they offer, maybe not just retail. Uh, entertainment is something we still lack. So that's something, but I think you're right. Here to stay <laughs> for now is, is, the, is the shopping center. Um, Suhail. Are you there? Uh, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. That's brilliant. Great. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks for coming back on. Um, so just to go back, I, I was asking about what lessons we've learned from the previous sort of property cycle. And just before 2020, we were going through a, an adjustment anyway, I think. Um, so I'm just wondering what you think about that and what adjustments w would we need to do, what, what, what we've learned from the previous cycle uh, going forward. Okay, excellent. Thanks so much for that. Uh, without adding on to what uh, Mumba has just said, uh, I believe uh, the commercial retail developers are now looking at more smaller community type uh, shopping centers, uh, bringing it closer to the high density areas to try and target the larger of the Zambian economy. Let's put it that way. They're also looking at uh, smaller centers around Zambia in the provincial capitals and uh, those are the type of developments that people are looking at uh, necessarily there has been a scaling down on the amount of square meters as you had uh, mentioned uh, with respect to the size of the shops so essentially that that seems to be the way they're going uh, the other uh, adjustment that we're seeing is uh, from the retailers themselves uh, they are now pushing a lot harder for turnover clauses and uh, looking at more quacha based type rentals. Uh, this is causing a little bit of a, a challenge with the landlords who necessarily have to charge in US dollars in line with the funding that they've received from the banks for the developers. So this is now the, the middle ground that will have to be achieved. But unfortunately with T-bills uh, sitting at the rate of now what, 30%, uh, it becomes a bit of a challenge to borrow in Kwacha since a lot of the banks in Zambia treat that as their cost of funds. So uh, it's unless you're happy to access finance at 31% or 32%, uh, there's always going to be that little bit of a mismatch between the funding in Kwacha as well as uh, the demand for the Kwacha. So uh, this is where the challenge is arising. 
Yeah, no, thanks for here. I think, I think yeah, the, the, the financing has always been what has driven the dollar-based rentals here um, and then comes back to the points you're making, you know, in terms of repayments, long-term, and institutional investors may well be having to look at the, the type of return period and even we might get on to talk about yields a bit later as well and the type of returns um, that they could get. Um, in Utu, switching uh, sector, um, going to offices, um, I wanted to ask you about the office sector. Um, perhaps if I could put it like this, what is the future of the office in Zambia? It's a discussion that's been going on globally and regionally. Uh, what do you think about uh, Zambia? Well, I think the future for office space in Zambia, um, we will have to be a little, we, we will have to start thinking outside the box in terms of office space. Um, I think pretty much a lot of organizations, um, COVID-19 has, has shown them that you can actually work from home. Some people have actually been more productive working from home. Um, so one has to think about what is the next, the next version of office space going to look like. Um, you know, the uptake has not necessarily been very high because what you basically have is just a lateral movement. People, you're not getting new, new people coming into the office space sector. This hasn't happened over 2019 and 2020. All you're having is just a move across. So the vacancy rate will more or less remain the same. Of course, as you know, the office space market is, is driven by the, the performance of the economy. If you look at 2004 to 2014, Zambia was one of the top 10, one of the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world. And when you look at the performance of the real estate sector, especially the office space market and retail, you can see that it was during this time that we had this boom. Now with us having contraction this year, next year, very, very minimal growth of about 1. Point, uh, about 1 1.7 to 2%. That definitely shows you that we won't expect in the short term the office space market to necessarily be, expand significantly. What we'll see is um, what, what, what we expect is even in some cases consolidation for businesses. If they have more than one office, we'll probably see consolidation. Um, COVID-19 is something that is also in terms of the layouts and designs for offices. You know, we all have to rethink how we interact within the office space. So the future office, the future office for Zambia in the office market and how it will perform will really be mainly driven by the performance of the economy. Um, and if the economy uh, happens to bounce back, we hope we'll. OK, thanks. Thanks, Anutu. Okay, thanks very much, Anutu. Um, yeah, it's an interesting time for the, for the office space. Um, Mumba, um, could I ask you about other sectors? Um, you know, as, a, as your background in terms of investment, pension fund, institutional investor, um, what sectors would you see are other sectors to invest in? And generally, how is the institutional investor looking at the market at the moment? Uh, thanks, uh, Suhail. I actually even see there's a poll that's running uh, for the participants to take part in where that same question has been addressed. But I think from our background as, as, as fund managers, as pension fund managers, um, the sectors that we're currently looking for are really guided by the return expectations that we have currently. I think um, Inutu put it quite clearly that economically we have not experienced the same growth spread that we had maybe two, three, four years ago. And, 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 and that also then spills over to maybe the institutional funders where there's pressure on, 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 on cash flows, especially for, for payouts and redemptions. And so the property market has, uh, or the type of properties we, we target has sort of evolved uh, we really look for your blue chip. Um, if this, if, if if properties were, were were equivalent to a debt, we would say your AAA tenants, um, really tenants that can 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 support a dollar 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 um, payouts. Um, I so 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 I think that's one sector that we do look for. Um, 
the tenant has to 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 ma match the risk profile of the investor. And currently, I think uh, the investment environment is a bit challenging uh, to the point that we really look for your triple A A, -A tenants. Uh, speaking to the dollar quacha uh, debate that's been going on, of course, um, in the long term, we prefer dollar leases just for the inflation protection that they do give. But I think we are, we are becoming a lot more aware that um, sustainability is, is key uh, within the portfolio. Uh, the worst thing you can have is have a dollar lease that goes 90, 80 days, 270 days late, um, and you're losing out on potential interest that you can earn. And so because in the pension sector, uh, maybe because a lot of our contributions do come in kwacha, maybe we don't have the same impact that maybe the banking sector can have. We do. We are even in, in, in looking and, and considering, maybe not in the, in the immediate term, um, maybe two, three, four years in the pipeline. I think it's, 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 a, it's a serious consideration that we need to, discussion that we need to have, uh, maybe in, in a way to mitigate with the inflation effect, we try and target short-term leases, um, good escalation clauses, uh, so that even though we're, we're locked in the quacha, uh, we can we can try and still get positive real returns for the investors. So I think on the on the, on the institutional side, uh, those are really some of the thoughts that we do have. The sector mixes are still the traditional sectors. Uh, we do we are looking out also for emerging sectors, uh, education, uh, healthcare. Uh, looking at the demographics, uh, whether it's on the short end or or the middle class, which is getting a lot older. I think education and healthcare is a sector where um, if we can create a good product uh, mix that can ad attract the quality uh, customer or, or attract customers, uh, we think those those sectors uh, can maybe have a better boom. But we still try and play in the traditional sectors, just looking for high quality tenants. Yeah, I mean, I think with our population, if you look at the demographic um, and a high proportion under the age of 25, a uh, high proportion under the age of 21, that has to be something to look at for the future for both those, those sectors, obviously education in particular, but, but also medical as well, and those specializations. Thanks, thanks very much, Mumba. Um, so Hale, just wanted to ask you, um, do you think that self-bill projects will be the dominant way forward in terms of residential? Do you, do you ever see a time when we might get to have more mass house building, whether for the low or the medium sector? Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that, Tim. I, I honestly believe uh, self-build is uh, the order of the day. Um, it's becoming more and more of a challenge for people to manage the cost of construction. Uh, we recently saw an increase in the cement prices. So uh, it's, it is becoming more and more expensive to build. Uh, and if you look at the, the steel prices along in line with the depreciation of the quacha, it becomes uh, quite a bit of a challenge. So uh, we will see a lot more self-build happening uh, with people trying to absorb as much of the cost as possible uh, in constructing their homes. Uh, going forward, I do see a little bit more uh, mass house housing projects uh, being developed, uh, predominantly for the public service. Uh, that, that that's pretty much what we would be looking at, as well as uh, together with the opening up of the roads and the ring roads, it's opened up a lot of uh, formerly agricultural areas, uh, which is a lot cheaper land for mass development. And uh, there are a number of projects being slated for such. So as the Lusaka decongestion project advances, I believe uh, people will save on uh, uh, travel time uh, which then may promote the mass projects uh, a little bit outside of the CBD of uh, Lusaka. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Sahel. Um, I think we'll just ask a couple of more questions individually and then maybe some more general questions to, to across the board for everyone to answer. Uh, we have also getting questions that, that are coming in as well, which I'll, I'd like to share. Um, so maybe just one more question each. Uh, in Nutu, are the, are the global trends, you know, we have these global trends of sustainability and flexible space. I know you touched on it a little bit with offices. Do you think they're relevant or how relevant they are to our market here? 
Well, I think the, the two major global trends, I mean, uh, on sustainability is issues around energy and, and, and water. Um, and I think these are things that we will now begin to take into serious consideration. I think developers and uh, any developer should now start looking at it. If we look at the cost of power right now and um, what it will do in the future, one has to look at alternative energy sources, reliability of power as well. That's something that is now becoming a real issue um, for any office occupier. So definitely it's that that type of global trend has to be taken into consideration now from a design perspective. Um, it has to, and also I think as, as tenants become a little bit more savvy and more educated around what their needs are, we will find that the differentiator, the differentiator between one building and another is their ability to, to guarantee power. Um, backup power through generators is something that has become quite costly. Um, and with the exchange rate being what it is today, you know, we don't know what the price of fuel will be. So I think looking at that water as well, I mean, um, you know, it was many years ago when you could find water at 50 meters. Now you hear people going as deep as 120 meters. So I think those are signs that we should now start seriously taking into consideration how best we conserve water, recycling of water, rainwater, harvesting to take advantage of those things. So yes, those global trends will come into play and they should, and we should be thinking about them now as opposed to waiting until um, the situation gets so dire that we have to start retrofitting. Um, when, when it comes to um, you know, flexible office space, um, I think, yes, that is actually, there are blurred lines now, if you see it internationally between what was the conventional office space and the flexible office space, because the services are becoming more or less similar. You've seen changes in real estate strategies for companies like Apple and Microsoft and Facebook who have now incorporated flexible office space into their real estate strategies. So for us, for Zambia, it will become uh, relevant because um, despite people being productive at home during COVID-19, some people have not been particularly productive at home. And they have now begun to see the need and for a, a smaller, probably smaller office, flexible office hours for members of staff, you know, that they could use um, while, whilst not having to come into the office. Um, uh, an interesting one is that actually on the mid-tier mid -tier market, um, which is really your kwacha, your kwacha rental, there is demand for flexible office space. You have your Gen Zs who are now, who are the next entrepreneurs, you know, that are coming forth. They see flexible office space as, as a way to work. Um, the, most of these have been either exposed to international education or have some form of regional education and so they they begin to appreciate and understand that that type of market because we're in a challenging economy it's also pushed a level of entrepreneurship into the younger generation um, and they are not they're 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 less fearful than we are <laughs> we were at their age um, and they're very they're quite comfortable not having a job and calling themselves entrepreneurs but they also see the relevance of having an, a space in which they can work in. So for the flexible office market for, for Zambia, I see there are opportunities around, around that market as well. It shouldn't be a market that ignored. Um, it, should, it, should, it actually should be something that's taken into consideration. Yeah. yeah thanks, Aluta. Yeah, I think it's an interesting time. Um, energy is one area that we all know we have to deal with in the region, uh, in Zambia in particular. Um, and to see rather than just adjusting to having to have backup power to rather incorporate it into design or building in the future is something that I think may well be more and more coming forward. Um, Mumba, if I could ask you a question that's, that's been sent in, um, it's, it's geared towards your expertise. The question is, do you see potential for collective investment vehicles in property investments i.e. property funds and REITs? Um, yes, we do. Um, I think the whole concept of a collective investment scheme um, really speaks to something that's very African, uh, where we come together, we pool together our resources, 
and 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 we and we are trying to achieve a goal, something akin to a village banking. But I think with the with the with the CIS market uh, locally, um, the the investor base is not uh, that deep enough uh, to really try and accumulate um, a big pool of of funds. Uh, I think any 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 CIS that maybe tries to 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 reach values of of over uh, two over hundred million kwacha. I think in the last two years or so, we have seen a bit of a challenge um, in terms of resource mobilization, and and the savings culture is still not there where we, where we can try and get big ticket um, CISs. So most of the CIS um, market here is still predominantly based on um, pension funds um, as well as institutional investors. So if 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 you are someone looking to set up a CIS of, of, of considerable size or, or, or a collective investment scheme in the property, uh, unless you're looking for a much smaller uh, size of, of property investment of 50 million, maybe you could try and try your luck on the retail side. But if you really want the larger ticket sizes, uh, you really have to try and reach out to the institutional investors. And, and I think as a vehicle, um, over the long term, if we can build our savings culture as a country, um, if we can, we, we think that is actually a, a good way to, to, to actually invest in properties. Um, we, a lot of the South African um, real estate investment trusts are here already and they do participate quite actively. And it's a pity uh, some of the larger malls um, that we do have here, we don't own them as Zambians. So I think going in, in, into the long term, I think uh, as fund managers at Aflife, I think that's one of our, our key strategies. Can we create vehicles for investors to, 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 to participate and own some of the large marquee. And it's not really just uh, a real estate, even hospital hospitals. I think recently our Securities Exchange Commission did announce rules for real estate investment trusts. Um, so that is actually a new emerging CIS product that can be launched uh, and listed on the, on, on the stock exchange. And so there are opportunities to, 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 to look for. I just I, I do I just do have concerns on on the retail side. I think your best bet is is is, is looking for the institutional money, um, and then as 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 the economy grows and as 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 the savings culture improves, I think we should see a, a bigger improvement of flows from 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 the retail uh, investors. Yeah, thanks, Mumba. Interesting that that uh, the REITs has recently uh, come through now from from. Uh, yeah, into the investment market as, a, as an opportunity. I know it's already existing in some other parts of the region. So it'll be interesting to see how it's taken up here in Zambia. Um, so Hale, a, a question that's come in, if I could put it to you, um, asking about what's the impact of the major infrastructure projects, such as, for example, in, in Lusaka, the Lusaka decongestion project? It's a very broad <laughs> question, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> if you could try and focus on some key impact that it's having. Okay, thanks so much, Tim. Uh, well, of course, the immediate impact at the moment is the inconvenience, uh, which is causing <laughs> a lot of us to live in the uh, But nevertheless, I think we're all hopeful uh, going forward that uh, the decongestion project will be largely successful and will alleviate some of the time spent in traffic and uh, the movements around in and around Lusaka. So necessarily the, the hope for this uh, decongestion project is that it will encourage increased productivity so that uh, the main populace in Lusaka is not necessarily wasting time in uh, traffic per se. So this boost of productivity hopefully should uh, impact on the bottom economic line. Uh, Uh, it will work without the necessary stress of getting to work. Uh, but in addition, uh, like uh, I had mentioned before, it's, it's opened up a number of areas in Lusaka. Uh, in addition to the agricultural space, which you had mentioned, uh, there's also residential spaces that have opened up, uh, which then enables people to live a little bit out of uh, Lusaka uh, and find cheaper properties where they're looking to self-build. Uh, and essentially uh, grow their own personal housing uh, portfolio from that perspective. Uh, the longer term impact 
uh, that it may have might be a little bit of a challenge given that uh, prices for housing within uh, Lusaka, Maine, uh, in and around the CBD are also falling. So, you know, from the housing space, uh, there will be a challenge on obtaining the rentals that were previously enjoyed in the sector a couple of years ago. But uh, by and large, it's hopeful that uh, Lusaka being the main capital city with in increased productivity, there should be a, an improvement in our economic circumstance uh, stemming from Lusaka. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, no, that's great. No, thanks. Thanks, Ahil. Yeah, I think infrastructure obviously overall is having a massive impact in opening up suburbs. Uh, you've got individuals who are building in an area where suddenly there's road access, tarred road. It's followed by the supporting services, small retail, small malls, etc., which support it as well as um, offices and, and clinics and hospitals um, and education. So there's no doubt if you look at a map of, of Lusaka 10 or 15 years ago and you look at it to, today, we, we know how it's grown and that links back to how we see the urbanization continuing around, around the country as well. Um, Inutu, if I could ask you, there was a question um, about warehousing. Um, it says, what's your take <laughs> on investing in warehousing um, and what would be prime location for warehouses for good returns at the moment? Um, well, I think for warehousing, um, should one be investing in that, taking off the back of what Mumba had talked about, about um, distribution centers, that one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us is the, require, is the need for distribution centers, coming off the back of what Mumba had said. Um, yes, warehousing should be something that one should be looking at. I think the current challenge we have is our industrial area is quite, um, is not best suited for um, large, uh, for distribution centers because of its positioning, I think more than anything, when you look at the light industrial area, the width of the roads, um, you know, the, you know, you're looking at uh, interlinks being able to easily drive in and out, um, security being quite secure. So, Locations, I think that are that are that are good for um, distribution centers would be you could be up on the great uh, the great north road starting from the Kafir Road side. You could look at that for warehousing as well as the great north. Um, are also good potential sites. Um, great North Road further up up beyond um, the Kabangwe Kabangwe um, roadblock. You could actually go further out there because once you're on that end, you're able to easily service the northern part of the, uh, the northern part of the city, Cab, where you look at Kapirimboshi. You know, you still need to go north in order to do to do work, and it's not too far off from either side. So either side of the city would would also work. You could also look at the Ngwerere area as well um, if you get the right if you. So those are those are areas that one could uh, potentially look at for industrial warehousing. The, the the cost is really at the end of the day. Is it a good return for your money? It all depends on how much you're going to build it for, um, the length of lease that you're going to enter into with a particular a particular tenant. Um, of course, the longer the better. But um, think like African life. Think blue chip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which nicely brings me to a question to you, Mumba. Um, it's a question about rentals uh, uh, in retail centers. Um, and the question is, since tenants are requesting for Quacha rentals, uh, can developers be flexible to consider rentals in Quacha um, and even have a cap rate uh, to cover for devaluations of, of the currency? Uh, I think that's a fair... A very tough question, <laughs> and I'm sure all, everyone, all the panelists know the, the tough conversations we do have with some of the tenants in our portfolios. Um, I think, like I said, uh, we are in a bit of a precarious time. Um, I think COVID-19, nobody saw it coming at the end of last year. And so uh, uh, even with, in, in previous webinars that we've seen with API, uh, not just in Zambia, I think rent relief is the order of the day. Um, there has to be some way of um, 
helping the tenants. Um, we, we believe it should be on both sides. Everyone should take a hit to some shape or form, the tenant and the landlord. Uh, and so we are we do consider um, fixed exchange rates to try and help the tenants, especially in this in these uncertain times as well as 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 as, as challenges. Uh, I can give an example. We, we, we have certain malls where we have betting companies and they were shut down for the longest time. And so you can't just let the, 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 them still pay their rent. You have to find ways to, to assist the business. So I think that is a, is a plan. I think going forward, um, I think one of the, the fundamental discussions we have as institutional fund managers is um, the currency uh, we have traditionally bought a lot of these properties has been in dollars. And so that's why we do also push for, for, for dollar leases. Uh, and so if, if, if uh, I think it, it was said earlier by, by an earlier panelist that we need to, to merge the, the, the goals or the, or the, or the, or the desires of, of the landlord, of the tenant, and of the funder. And, and if the tenant is moving towards Kwacha, uh, then, then, then transactions have to start being considered in Kwacha base. Um, I think on the pension side, at least, uh, the cost of funding is not as big as an issue um, um, as, as you find with your traditional banks, uh, where, 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 where maybe the, the, the returns and the, and the risk profile is still a bit high in the country, hence the high interest rates. Um, I think on the pension side, um, although properties has not been the flavor of the day, um, going into the long term, the only way we go into Kwacha type leases is if we go into Kwacha type transactions. Um, and, and I think the Kwacha lease um, it will be interesting to hear my thoughts from my other panelists. How do you think um, the, the best structure of the Kwacha lease is? We think keeping it short term, um, having an escalation that's linked to inflation, uh, all of those can try and protect the investor in the long run. Um, but, but the discussion cannot take place if transactions are still in dollars. Um, I think that's, that's, that's a key thing that needs to be fixed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bomba. Maybe I can just open this one up. Um, and, and, and the next question to everybody. So Sahel, what, what do you think about the, the, the Quacha rental issue uh, and, and how to deal with it going forward, both particularly in retail, but there are obviously other sectors as well. Thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there, there's a little bit of a challenge between the the cost of Quacha funding from the commercial and uh, relative to the cost of uh, dollar funding. So uh, necessarily you're looking at a difference of, let's say, 8 to 9% on the US dollar. This is average approximately 30% as a lower range of uh, the cost of funding per annum uh, on the Quacha funding from the commercial banks. So. Uh, going forward, what uh, with the advent of the REIT uh, rules and guidelines, uh, which should be coming from SEC shortly, uh, we're hoping with uh, more institutional investors participating in the real estate sector through the REIT mechanism or CIS uh, type scheme, we're hoping that there would be a little bit more equity from the local pension funds and institutional funders which may then be able to support the development of the uh, commercial centers through quacha based funding, uh, where you could look at uh, inflationary type mechanisms for escalations. So uh, if we match the escalation on the rentals to the inflation rate, then the institutional investment in quacha may be able to obtain a better return than inflation on their pension uh, holders, uh, let's say, for their stakeholders, uh, let's put it from that perspective. So uh, there would definitely need to be more investments uh, from uh, our guys like uh, Mumba over there. Thanks, Mumba. And uh, other players such as NAPSA and the others uh, who are large pension funds who could assist to continue to drive the property sector. Uh, the challenge is is for quite a borrowing with the, the government on the treasury bill. The, the moment the government is well, let's put it that perspective. Thanks, Sahil. Yeah, I think it's all about um, 
you know, if you look at inflation, if you look at the exchange rate issues uh, and balancing it against the financing issues that, that you guys have mentioned for the longer term. Um, I think we're, we're sort of coming to the last five minutes. So perhaps I can throw this question out to everybody to just give a, a one minute answer, if you, if you don't mind. Um, I'm sort of ending with a question that was sent in, which says, where do you see the greatest gain for property owners and investors? Um, so sort of looking in the future. And is the Zambian market ripe for mid to large scale already built property investment at the mid-level rental range? Um, something I think that, Lutu, you mentioned at the beginning. But if I could start with you there on, on that question. Sorry, I can't hear you, Anutu. Can other people hear you? Sorry. Sorry, sorry, I had my mic yeah. on mute. No, no problem. No problem, thanks. Uh, I did that at the beginning. <laughs> it hasn't been <laughs> um, I said uh, where I see the greatest gains um, is is actually where you take advantage of the existing, you know, taking advantage of the low hanging fruit. So because we have such a large self build market, um, if one is going to look at investment on a large scale into real estate, one should be taking advantage of the self build market. And that would mean actually looking at um, large pieces of land and parceling them up into smaller sizes and then selling them on. Um, the issue there is around how much, what your cost of infrastructure will be, the cost of the land as well, and to be able to, 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 to package it in such a way that it still becomes affordable to the, to, the, to the larger consumer. You've seen people have done this extensively. I mean, the stories of uh, Minwood, um, Roma Park, Eureka, the, those are prime examples. Um, and going outer going into the outskirts of Lusaka, you still see this happening although on a very small scale up in Leopards Hill, a Great North Road, uh, Lusaka West, uh, Lusaka East, these things are these things are still happening. Um, so that was the first part of the question that I, um, I actually heard. The second part was? The second part um, is, well, let, let me, if we stick to the first part, so I can also, because we're running out of time a little bit, um, and go to the to the other um, two uh, panelists, if you don't mind, and Lutu, and ask them the same, uh, the same thing. Um, so Sahel, we've got about a couple of minutes, so if you don't mind, just a minute to answer. Uh, where do you see the greatest gain for property owners and investors in the future? And then, then Mumba, if you don't mind answering that as well. Are you on mute, Sahel? <laughs> thanks for that. It's just the same. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, uh, quick one the greatest gain that I see for property developers at this moment in time is to look at uh, the smaller, more provincial capitals and the more expansive economic zones around Zambia uh, to put in the smaller scale type investments with uh, a size enough to allow for a scale development in phases. So, phase one is relatively small, get the market moving followed by phase three, which will have a scale as that particular provincial town grows. Uh, so as opposed to letting the market come to you, you go to the market. And that, that's essentially where I see the biggest grains going forward. Okay, thanks, Sahil. Mumba, 30 seconds before we hand over back to uh, Kafir to, to, to conclude. Yeah, uh, I think from my end, I'm in a total agreement with the other panelists um, in terms of, 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 of whether it's on the residential side or also um, the other sectors that were described by Su Su Suhail. I think also one thing to note is you, as an investor, you also have to understand your goals when you're going into the investment. So if you are out there looking for high growth, high returns, expect a high risk. If you're looking for the low growth um, or, or, or low risk, um, there are certain sectors that we play in, like I said, the blue chip, stable, uh, no stress, uh, where, where, where that could, that, where that could suit you. So I think as an investor, it's also important to understand where your risk profile is 
um, and, 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 but, but in general, I think as individuals, it's important uh, within our uh, portfolios or as or our savings that we all have some form of, of property investment. Great. Thank you so much. Um, from, from my side, thank you, Inutu, Sahel, and Mumba for your uh, great answers and participation today. Much appreciated by me, and it was, it was a great session. Uh, thanks to everybody out there for, for listening. And I can hand back to Kafir if he's there to conclude. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, yeah, thanks to the panel. It was a great session. Um, so some great takeaways. And yeah, obviously a lot of traction, and a lot of things has happened in Zambia over the last couple of years. So um, we've seen some a lot of interest for the session. And obviously it's it's tough times, but um, I do think there's some yeah, there's some some good opportunities still within the market. So um, thank you everyone uh, for, for for and thank you to the panel uh, for joining, sharing your insights, Tim for the for moderating the session and uh, putting forward that presentation. Um, and thank you to the audience for um, tuning in, sending through some great questions. Um, and yeah, um, we I think we'll end it off there. Um, and yeah, we look forward to next week. We'll be uh, continuing the series where we focus on uh, the Francophone region next week, um, looking at Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. Um, and then we'll push on toward the, uh, the API Summit virtual um, at the end of September. So uh, thank you for, to the panelists, and thank you to the audience, um, and we'll catch you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.